Uh, hello, people, and uh, welcome to uh, the first of my new YouTube series. I'm going to do some uh, recording of some coaching sessions, and uh, hopefully people uh, can use this as a tool to learn from Amulet. Uh, I'm here with uh, Harrison today, and uh, we're going to start off with, uh, let's let's talk about, you. do you want to talk about the list at all, or you had some questions? What were your questions? just um i guess general uses for so I, i've been playing amulet for a few years i mean i mean i don't know what i guess when was a uh, field of the bed a uh, field of the dead band <laughs> gotcha yeah i've been playing for a while and i kind of like self-taught myself in a way mm -hmm. and i always looked at lists online i'm just kind of like one of the biggest things that i've always kind of thought of was what was the reason for adding like if you have more turn timbers or mm -hmm. What, you, what determines when you have more explorers over that, mm -hmm. um, why some lists might run like one Tolari West versus two, mm -hmm. and just like those those weird configurations. I, I, I kind of always like look at maybe two or three lists, and I kind of like mish them just a little bit to things that I like doing. Yeah. Um, I just always, always kind of wanted to figure out like, what, was the, what was the thought behind having more turn timber versus more explorer and what advantages and disadvantages those kind of give you. Yeah, so I guess um, as far as turn timber, when I want that in the list or not, to me that's like uh, thought sees, I think, is the biggest thing that makes me want turn timber. So I think back to like when there was a like Luris Death Shadow match meta and just like everybody was playing a bunch of like thought seizes that made me really like turn timber symbiosis because you could like just play it down as a land and then like when you were ready to cast it you could like play a bounce land and bounce it and cast it and so it's like always having this threat that is like not able to be hit by thought seize once it's on the battlefield and then like that can become a threat you know like when you need it to be I, i'm not I've, I've been coming around to not really being excited about turn timber in the current meta um you know i'm probably thinking if i'm not on karn i'm probably wanting like one to two copies of turn timber because um it does miss a reasonable amount of the time which is kind of unfortunate and also you know it, it does take the slot of like you know some maybe other lands that um could be useful you know things like an extra basic forest an extra layer of the hydra an extra besaju an extra castle an extra cavern of souls you know like all of those are really strong lands so i i don't think i don't think there's enough like like i said i think it's like thought sees is the card that kind of makes me want um turn timber it's really threat density too like also just generally like if you're expecting a lot of your threats to like not necessarily be countered but be interacted with in some way it's always nice to have something else that like gets you a next threat um but yeah i'm not i'm not actually super excited about turn timber in the current meta um Expl explore i think is really good with like cultivator colossus in general because like it advances you towards the cultivator colossus while also helping you keep like that critical mass of cards in hand um it's also like good when you're going for sort of like the incremental ramp sort of all works together. So I think of like Castle Garenbrig would be and like Arboreal Grazer and Amulet. I also count as like incremental ramp because I think they all sort of in a vacuum basically ramp you one. Um, the Amulet ramping you one because like if you play a bounce land with an Amulet in play, that's two mana on a turn where you would have otherwise just had one mana. So it's like it's in a vacuum. I think an Amulet is like plus one mana and a Castle is plus one mana. Arboreal Grazer is like plus one mana. Explorer is like plus one mana. So like having a lot of those types effects together, it kind of like helps you get to like six more quickly, if that makes sense. to like the uh, the explorer idea I get, so i didn't have the right thought behind that and i do agree it's it's definitely uh i guess if you're not hitting titan or cultivator colossus it's you're kind of missing on the on a lot of your draws there and you mm -hmm. run i mean amulet's historically always runs between 32 to 34 lands so your chances of hitting your land are 
pretty high within the top seven of your deck. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Dryad's kind of a hit. Yeah, Dryad's, Dryad can definitely be a hit, especially because, like, it comes down with seven toughness, which, like, seven toughness is a very relevant number in an unholy heat meta um but generally speaking i also think it's kind of, turn timber is kind of like weak to counter magic whereas like uh like summoner's pact if your opponent like counter spells a summoner's pact it's not like the end of the world because like you have spent zero mana on it so you get like a lot of situations where it's like you have a cavern you can either like have a cavern of souls in hand and cast a summoner's pact and they don't counter the summoner's pact because they want to counter the titan and then you play the cavern of souls and titan or you play a summoner's pact they counter the summoner's pact and you've spent no mana and then you just play a land and play like another summoner's pact and a titan or just like play a titan like there's been times where i've been like sitting on five mana into like two open blue mana with like a summoner's pact and a primeval titan in hand and i will lead on the summoner's pact occasionally like that's not a play i will do a lot but it's occasionally like i think like get my opponent to counter the summoner's pact for the titan to resolve kind of thing if i don't have a cavern yes uh, no, i definitely agree with that because i mean if you've already done that play once they might be opted to just counter the pact right there thinking you might need that for the titan and you have the cavern in hand mm -hmm. oh yeah i mean like there's also like definitely like a psychology thing of like whatever you did in like the previous game being able to do the other thing right it's like oh, my opponent really should have countered the Summoner's Pact in game one, so now I'm going to play a Summoner's Pact in game two that they really shouldn't counter, and, like, I think they're so much more likely to just because they're going to have that, like, very recent memory. And, you know, I don't know with, like, you know, with better players, that kind of thing might not work, but I think there's a lot of people who don't really understand all the ins and outs of Amulet, so, like, understanding that like sometimes certain plays are going to be the right play for your opponent sometimes they're not is, is like an, an information advantage for you because like you can understand like the different intricacies and possibilities that somebody who's not an expert in amulet uh might not and, and you can take advantage of that right totally agree yeah um, so, uh, going ahead and looking at your list, one of the things I notice is that you're running two Castle Garenbrig, and if I'm counting, I only see three forests, because there's no breeding pool and no fetch land in the list. Is that... Uh, yes, I had, I had taken, um, the breeding pool and the fetch land out for, mm. uh, I believe it was the, the Bajuka Bog and the, and the Radiant Fountain. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I've actually been pretty low on Castle recently just because I think there's always, like, this tension between, like, Castle and Cavern of Souls um, where it's like, you know, you can't play a Titan off of both Cavern of Souls and Castle and, like, Cavern doesn't pay for the Castle. So I've been actually pretty low on Castle recently and I've even done several lists without Castle and it seems like your list is, like... It, if you're trying to fit in like this Bajuka Bog Radiant Fountain type thing, you might even be better served at this point when you're down to three forests just cutting the castle. Because the castle that enters tapped is really, really, really bad. So like at this point, like you could even be cutting the castles. You could be able to fit like an extra Cavern of Souls in your main deck, like instead of the sideboard. And like untapped green sources are great. And, you know, there's a lot of other options you could do, even just another basic forest for, like, having things to, you know, besage you or dry it under Blood Moon. Uh, or, you know, I've been trying things like Layer of the Hydra. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of options you can do. I think, like, with the... Or even another Turn Timber Symbiosis, if you, if you do like Turn Timber Symbiosis. But I think there's a lot of things that you can do with that slot that I, I don't think I would really be liking Castle... Um, in a list with only three forests in it. I mean, obviously, it still comes into play untapped if you have a dryad in play, but I don't. I don't necessarily think you can count on that. Yeah, I mean, most of the time you try to play a dryad on turn two, and you want to live the dream and cast your titan on turn three with a with a with a castle gear and break, but 
Mm -hmm. I mean, most people, if they're if they're playing amulet, if they play against the amulet enough, they know to to kill the dryad. <laughs> yeah, and I think in general we're just in a very interactive meta right now. I think like that's largely because of Ragavan. Like Ragavan makes the interactive decks good both because like the interactive decks that play ragavan and then if you're not playing ragavan you have to be able to interact to kill ragavan so like everybody's become like very very interactive now so i think in general we're expecting more for our dryads for our amulets to not sit on the field as much and we're more just trying to like cobble together six mana for a titan in any way we can I mean, the advantage of the current world is, yes, everything's more interactive and our things aren't sitting around, but also people aren't killing us as quickly. There's not that sort of, like, two ships passing in the night of, like, the sort of, like, Storm and Tron type of things. So, like, where the game ends or effectively ends very early on. Um, so you, it is fine to just get the land drop out of the Dryad and have it killed, uh, or the Explorer, the Azusa, or whatever, and, and get to Titan. Um, and then I noticed you have um, you have some interesting stuff in your sideboard. I noticed the, the Rurikthar and the uh, Yasharm, or however you say that. Can you tell me what, what your thoughts are behind those? Yeah, so... matchups that I like, struggle with the most mm -hmm. are, and I think this might be like collective for everybody, is uh, uh, Yawgmoth and um, is it Murktide? Mm -hmm. Now, Rurikthar, and also Rurikthar, I, I, also, I also have like one or two people in my meta that, in like my like my LGS that runs Storm, so mm -hmm. Rurikthar is just like something that I like to have. Mm -hmm. um, but I've also realized that Rurikthar is pretty decent against an in some Murktide matches where they get it down early because it just kind of punishes them for cantripping. Mm -hmm. It's a little easier to cast under Blood Moon because it only needs the one green pip. Mm -hmm. It has reach, so if they try to give a little, like, get a little Murktide, it mm -hmm. blocks that. It even blocks the uh, the Dragon Race Channelers or even the, what do you call it, the Burn Advisor. Um, mm -hmm. It blocks that guy pretty good. And then... So I usually bring it in for like the Blood Moon matches and just like the Murktide matches in general, just to get so I get more threat density. Mm -hmm. And then Yasharn, that is mainly in there for Yogmoth. No, that makes sense as like an anti Yogmoth card if you're if you're having trouble with Yogmoth. Um, I'm not. I mean, obviously, if you've got Storm in your local meta, I guess like if there's. If that's something, you know, if you're going to an FNM and there's, you know, 15 people and one of them is playing Storm, I think having a Rogthar in your sideboard makes sense. Um, I think general in like, in general, in like an MTGO meta or like a larger tournament meta, I, I'm not excited about Rogthar. I think if you're trying to beat Murktide, I'd be more excited with like, a, maybe like a Dragonlord Dramoka, because at that point, you know, you're... Um, you're dodging Unholy Heat, which, like, I the biggest thing I'm afraid of with Rurikthar is, like, it's just going to come down, it's going to immediately eat an Unholy Heat, and the Sixth Life isn't really going to matter so much because, like, it's not like we really pressure life totals in any real way with this sort of deck. So, I don't know, just a thought for me is, like, um, there's also... Um, Arasta, the it's like a two green, two colorless, three five uh, spider with reach that whenever anyone casts an instant or sorcery, you get a one two spider token with reach. So it's like if you're trying to particularly target Murktide, I might uh, look and you want to do it with like a green creature. I might look to like maybe one of those options. Um, I I I'm just I I think I my problem with Rurikthar. Obviously, it's great against Storm, and I don't want to, like, downplay. If you're playing against Storm, if you expect to play against Storm, it's a completely reasonable card to have in your sideboard. But I think always my problem with Rurik Thar, whenever it's been in the sideboard of Amulet, is um, how often you're going to run into the situation where you play with Rurik Thar, immediately the Rurik Thar is going to get answered by some removal spell, and then the fact that the six damage was dealt is not really going to be significant in the context of a match 
of something more controlling versus amulet. Like the life total of your opponent isn't really generally what the game is about. Um, so that's just my thoughts on that. Okay, that's totally fair. Yeah. Were there other questions you had about like list or card choice or anything else about amulet? Just general questions you wanted to ask? timber versus the explorer mm -hmm. issue and that was answered great um i guess in terms of like land base i mm -hmm. was kind of i was kind of curious about like the the differences between like what hand war and mm -hmm. the slayer stronghold gives you i know like slayer stronghold grants you that ability to um it, at least grants you the ability to turn two if you mm -hmm. would like to do that um is hand war like more is it what it would be considered slower or is that i mean it is sl slower it's also like so it's a sort of trade-off you're making because there's a lot of times where it's like you're gonna have fair matchups where like slayer's sun home being in your deck is not gonna make a huge difference because like once you've resolved a primeval titan you're just getting so much value that you're overvaluing your opponent outvaluing your opponent and you're just going to win the game just on the pure raw power level and card strength of primeval titan i think what slayers and sun home gives is it sort of gives like the splinter twin aspect to the deck is is maybe the best way to put it which is like making your opponents unable to tap out and then like so like uh especially like control opponents aren't able to like tap out as much because there's always the possibility that if they tap out the game will instantly be over and then also um the aspect of uh like combo decks so i think of something like belcher uh is like a good example and you mentioned storm uh like something where um like you may play a titan you may resolve that titan you may attack with the titan you may get all these lands and you know your opponent has no way to overcome me with card advantage but they are just able to like suddenly kill you so like i think the current meta right now is pretty fair so like i think handwire in the current meta kind of makes a certain amount of sense even though i'm still on slayer sun home um currently but like the idea with Handwire is when you play Handwire, you get to cut Boros Garrison from your mana base for, you know, either Green Bounce Land or another land. You get to cut Sun Home from your mana base, which is a colorless land which doesn't really do anything. And you get to cut um, potentially Crumbling Vestige because I think one of the big advantages with Crumbling Vestige is like when you have Dryad in play being able to like crumbling vestige for like get like slayer stronghold plus crumbling vestige and that like haste the titan while keeping more lands in play kind of thing so it's like a pseudo boros garrison with the crumbling vestige when you have dryad in play um and also like there's a lot of times where like you use crumbling vestige like to activate a slayer stronghold that you already have in play when you need that extra mana or to activate a sun home that you already have in play but maybe don't have that extra red or white mana. So, like, you don't really need Crumbling Vestige as much. So it's like, if the Slayer's in the hand wire, you know, that's just like a swap, right? And then you've got three lands in the mana base that, like, you get to take out. And there's a lot of things you can do with that space. You know, that space can be more caverns, that space can be more bounce lands, that space can be Layer of the Hydra, that space can be extra castle of garen brig that space can be extra basics you know a fetch land like there's just a lot of things that you can do with that space so i think i talked about this a bit when we did like the lands episode of the podcast is like when i want to play handwire is when i know what i want to do with that space because like the lands that you're getting rid of the combo potential you're getting rid of is something very valuable for the deck but in the right meta like i think an example i gave is there was a meta of like with luris it was like very hammer 
and Death Shadow were like the big decks of the format. And I just built a deck where I'm like, I'm running four Turn Timber Symbiosis to beat Death Shadow, and I'm running three Beseju in my main deck to help me beat um to help me beat Hammer and a like a fourth Beseju in the sideboard. Right. And it's like I am running a lot. That's like a big strain to put on the mana base. And it's like you got to it's got to give somewhere. The mana base has to give somewhere. And where in that case it it gave was by doing the hand wire. So it's like, you know, you, you got to decide is like when you're running hand wire, it's like it gives you space if there's something you really, really want to be doing with that space in the current meta. Okay, so yeah, that, so if you want to run the hand war, it gives you more space, uh, it gives you a lot more flex slots for the lands that you might want to use. Yeah. But Slayer Stronghold is just the, the yeah, like, like you like just using word that you said, the Splinter Twin aspect of A yeah. must be equal to your dead. Yeah, so I think the time where Handwire is good is when you have a very narrow meta that is very fair, and I think when Boros Slayers is good is when you have a very open meta or a meta that's very unfair. Okay, and yeah, like a lot of the tournaments I go to um, out of town are more of the open meta. So mm -hmm. I know there's a lot of, I think there's like three or four living end players. There's also mm -hmm. a couple of Titan players. Yeah, and I think I think that's pretty typical of modern right now in general i think modern's very open like we have our best decks we have our merc tides and our four colors and our living ends but it's not like it's not like you know hogak it's not like you know you know car clan ironworks the best decks are not dominating the format there's still you know tons of people doing all sorts of things other than just like those specific decks yeah everyone's just kind of everyone's just kind of fighting on each other yeah that maybe for a different fight for a different land i do like layer of the hydra and i had been mm -hmm. i was like uh, and I, I had the same thought too i was like what do i cut mm -hmm. for the layer because i'm just like i don't want to cut another forest and i don't want to cut a bounce land but i also don't want to cut any of my other utility lands so i guess castle garenberg is the next best spot for that cut. yeah i mean i'm looking at your list right now and i'm counting two turn simbers plus the Beseju plus the uh, two caverns, the vestige, and the three forests. So I'm seeing like nine turn one green sources. And I think Jose Moniz says he usually shoots for like 10 turn one green sources. And I tend to agree with that. I think that's usually like where I want to be. So I think like you know, cutting a castle for a turn one, at least one castle for like a turn one green source, whether that's a basic forest, a Beseju, a layer of the Hydra or a cavern, you know, makes a lot of sense to me in a list like this. Okay. And then I guess like in terms of like, um, the sideboard, yeah, mm -hmm. Ruthar is always kind of like back and forth on, I mean, it was like that mm -hmm. one big, uh, the one big flex slot I always kind of like looked at, which is mm -hmm. like, uh, you could probably go, but and then I always think of myself, see storm today <laughs> yeah yeah so i definitely agree to that when it comes down to that but i know the like the hardest hardest matchup i could ever and i, I don't ever I, it feels like every time i play it too it's like almost unbeatable um is the is the ogmoth matchup mm -hmm. and like i know for sure like myself i have like maybe i think i've i think i've only ever beat yog like one time out of the probably the 20 i've ever played it hmm it is it is such i don't i have no idea what's wrong either. i just like i just have like i feel like i just have a, such a bad matchup against the Yeah, yeah can i ask with this list you know what what you think your sideboard plan would be against yog and we can maybe talk about that and see if that's something maybe that um we can consider I sometimes might bring in Rurixar just so I have more, just like more threats. Mm -hmm. um, I could be wrong, but um, before I didn't have the Asharn. I had okay. A, uh, I think, let me check this list here. Is it in here still? No, I don't have it anymore. Okay. So when I originally had it, I think it was either an extra fire spout or a pissing needle in that slot. Mm hmm. 
normally I bring in the hearse, uh, the fire spout. I would bring in the endurances and I would bring in that pithy needle mm -hmm. or, the, uh, or whatever that fist slot was. Yeah. Normally I would take out. So let's just talk about what you would do with I So we could talk, you know, about other lists too, but let's just say that, let's just take this list for an example and then we'll talk about principles. Uh huh. Everything else is just kind of medium. Uh, if I had this list with me, I'd be putting in the Ashard as well. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the sideboarding, mm -hmm. I would be. I usually get opted to take out maybe like one amulet, mm -hmm. one saga. Mm -hmm. I usually sideboard out um, either one or both of Zeus's. Mm -hmm. um, and then maybe either. I'd either take out a Turd Timber or a Colossus. Mm hmm. Okay, so I think there's some little optimizations that we can make on this. So first of all, in the things that you're sideboarding in, I think you're sideboarding in, in too many things. So I definitely wouldn't bring in Rurik for, for sure, because, I mean, they're a deck based around creature combo, not non-creature. I know you said you want more threats, and like against it, I can understand that against a deck that's running Necromentia, but I think really like Cultivator Colossus is our thing to do about Necromentia. Um, I don't think I want the Unlicensed Hearse or the Second Endurance. I think generally fighting on that axis is kind of a losing battle for us. At the most, it's going to slow them down a turn, and sometimes it won't stop slow them down at all sometimes they'll kill us in the same amount i mean and post sideboard they could be doing things like magus of the moon they can be doing things like hapatra so like i don't think really fighting on the graveyard front is like what we're trying to do i think we're just trying to combo and kill them faster they, than they combo and kill us um so i do like the fire spout the endurance and the yasharan um coming in as far as the sideboarding out, I generally don't think I would want to sideboard out an amulet in a matchup like this because um, even though they do have interaction for it and things like Force of Vigor, um, I think it's very, very important for us to be going quickly. I think cutting a Nurse's Saga can make sense, um, but especially, you know, if you're expecting like Eldritch Evolution into Magus of the Moon, um... You know, I, I would love if this list had, uh, I don't know if you, can you scroll over, did this list have Dismembers? Yes, oh, um, so that's actually what, that's what I was missing, yeah, Dismembers yeah. is what I bring in too. Okay, so yeah, I would bring in the, so I think I'd bring in that five rather than bringing in like seven, I think if you're bringing in seven, you're bringing in too much. Um, I generally don't think I would, I like cutting the first Azusa. I never really want to cut the second Azusa because I just think there's too many situations where like uh, the ability to pact for Azusa enables a lot of like combo turns that you otherwise can't do. Um, so I think there's just like an importance to having the second Azusa there. Um, like an example being, you know, like, I don't know, uh, pacting for Azusa after as saga comes off on on turn three you know potentially like you could have like turn one castle garen brig or sorry turn one saga turn two castle garen brig turn three azusa you know like packed for azusa and that gets you to tighten with a bounce land um now if we're cutting the castles you know i'm i'm just talking about this list you know but but ju i'm just more saying generally speaking i think there's a lot of things that azusa enables um, I'm also not super excited about cutting the second cultivator, but we'll, we'll see based on what other things we can take out. So we'll, we'll see. I definitely think you should be cutting the Bajuka Bog in a matchup like this because, is, yeah, not very good. <laughs> yeah, I mean, sorcery speed, graveyard hate does basically nothing against them. Um... I also think there's the potential to look at Expedition Map as something to cut um, because, um, like, they are a, like, Force of Vigor, Magus of the Moon type deck. 
And it's like, so there's a certain amount of your sagas are going to get to three less often. And so like just kind of moving away from like that sort of depending on the saga type thing. I mean, I think one of the things that like is a good reason to have expedition map in the deck is sometimes you can keep hands and make sequencing where it's like, well, if I draw a bounce land, I'm going to get to go absolutely nuts. And if I because I've got like, I'll have two amulets after this saga comes off. But if I don't draw a bounce land when the saga comes off, I'll be able to like expedition map, use the expedition map to get a bounce land and maybe cobble something together. And that's not really dependable against like a force of vigor, like Magus of the Moon deck, right? It's like, there's so many ways that that can go wrong because they might, if you're in a hand that's very much depending on doing a lot of amulet stuff and then they like force a vigor, your saga and amulet or they Magus of the Moon and the saga has gone, you're kind of just in a bad spot. Yeah, they've, uh, they've theoretically stone reindeer <laughs> on both accounts. Right, right. Um, I think... Um, also, just generally speaking, I think when you have that besage you in the sideboard, any matchup where you're not, um, where counter spells don't matter at all, I think it's always a good idea to swap in the second besage you for uh, Cavern of Souls. Um, it's just sort of an upgrade, you know, cast explore, you know, pays for packs, uh, you know, pays for turn timber, that kind of thing. Um, and the legend rule, I don't, I mean, I don't know if I would go up to like a third besage you if you had another besage you, but I think up to two, the legend rule is going to matter a lot, lot less than like, you know, being an actual green source rather than like a pseudo green source. Um, yeah. And so with the cultivator, I think, I think, I think cutting one cultivator is fine. It's kind of tricky because you're making your ter turn timbers kind of bad, but you are bringing in two creatures. It's a little bit um, questionable for me against Necromentia. I could see cutting like one explore to keep the cultivator in the deck, but I think you could go sort of either way i think explorer is kind of weak in a matchup like this where you're trying you're both trying to combo less than do fair things but um yeah that that's a, that's a thing that i'm like less convinced on than the other stuff i would say so i would say the the amulet the big things i want to say is the amulet and the azusa you definitely want to be leaving in your deck and uh and the Endurance and the Unlicensed Hearse, uh, Endurance number two and the Unlicensed Hearse are definitely things you don't want to be bringing in. And of course, yeah, if you play this, if you play the Unlicensed Hearse by turn two, they might just have the Force of Vigor anyway. Like, yeah. Said, leaving more artifacts is not, not necessarily a good thing versus... Or they might just play a Magus of the Moon, right? Yeah. Like, then, like, attack you with creatures, right? It's not, you know... It's not really advancing the game plan. It's like we want any time you're bringing in that hearse, you're either cutting a land, you're cutting like a ramp slash combo piece, or you're cutting a piece of interaction for their deck, like like the dismembers, the fire spouts. It's like I think all of those things are better than hearse. I'd rather have a land than hearse. I'd rather have an explore than a hearse. And I'd rather have a, you know, like dismember than a hearse, you know, so. Or a fire spout. Yeah, I to yeah, totally agree with that. Uh, I never really never really thought about it on like that access before. I mean, obviously, you just like when you're in there, you just kind of yeah. zone in on like these are hate cards. Let's yeah. Put these in. Right. I and I think this is one of the biggest things I see with like amulet players as one of the biggest things that I think where most amulet players can improve is in making the sideboarding a little bit better and one of the biggest mistakes I see most often is they see a card that does something in the matchup like you see endurance and your opponent is interacting with their graveyard right and so it's like so i want to bring in endurance and i think you need to like challenge that assumption i i kind of i think i've said this before is like i have like the explore test where i ask is this card better than an explorer 
and if not, I'm not bringing it in. And really, I think when you get to play Amulet more, you'll, or, you know, when people, I'm not saying you in particular, because you've said you've played it for a while, but like, as people play Amulet more, I think you can get this sort of jaded feeling of like, oh, nothing's better than an explorer. There's nothing in my sideboard that's better than an explorer. I'm never sideboarding, which is like, I don't think a bad thing to feel, right? You really want to only be bringing in sideboard cards when you're like, oh my gosh, this is a 10 out of 10, the absolute best thing I want in this matchup. Dismember against Yogg, that is like the one card I'm absolutely super excited about every time I play Yogg. Or like, force of vigor against hammer yeah i want to be bringing that in but if a sideboard card is not making you feel that like oh my gosh this is a 10 out of 10 great you should really really be challenging whether you should bring it in in the matchup okay that's yeah that's definitely good that's definitely good to thought think on yeah um now did you want to look at some matches did you want to talk about other sideboarding do you want to talk about other questions Okay. Also, like, I can kind of navigate Murktai, but that's like the mm-hmm. also like hardest matchup for me. Yeah. So can we uh can we get this so that the six you have uh yeah, there we go. Yep. Uh oh no, it looks like they got uh shuffled into the sideboard. So it was Colossus oh. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yeah it was Colossus that. Cavern Map uh Azu And, and um, Bajukaba, yeah. There we go. All right. So first of all, okay. So first of all, there's one card in your sideboard that, or I should maybe say like two cards maybe in the sideboard that are like the absolute ten out of ten. You definitely want to bring in. Do you know what I would probably say those would be? Uh, endurances are good, but I, I would say the 10 out of 10 for me in this sideboard against Murktide is first of all, Cavern of Souls. Okay. Yeah. You're right on that one. That's the, you won't even question for a moment if you want to bring in Cavern of Souls. Now Murktide's a bit of a weird matchup. I think there's a lot of different approaches to this. I know, um, uh, Mistaken, who's a good amulet player who, uh, has a list kind of similar to this. It's also like a two cultivator list. Uh, not running turn timbers though. Um, likes to go a bit more mid rangey in a matchup like this. So does bring in more stuff. But so uh, kind of going against what I the, just said. I think against Murktide, I do think we want the cavern. I think we want the hearse for sure. Um, I think we want the Besaju because of Blood Moon and Dress Down. Uh, I think you want the endurances because I I think they're quite strong, and I think you want the fire spout and dismember. Um, and would you do like both dismembers, or would you just do like a one split? Right? I think I would do both dismembers. Um, but maybe I don't know. One one split could also be fine. Um, and then um, I think I think Rurikthar is also not a terrible card but like i said i'd really love it if it was like a dragon lord dromoka more so let's see maybe let's put that in our maybe pile and let's see what we're cutting first of all um so one thing that i've seen a lot of people i i've seen done before with a list like this and this is not something you have to do but i think um there's some amount of like trimming on summoners pact just because like you want to be casting your things off caverns now i think that it makes more sense to trim summoners pact when you have like four endurance and two tireless tracker in your board or like four endurance and a dragon lord dromoka um i'm not sure exactly but i think we can probably pull let's let's just for a start let's say two summoners packed um and i'm also not for similar reasons i'm not terribly excited about turn timber symbiosis Mm -hmm. 
So I think we can potentially put that in the pile of things we're probably going to end up cutting. And I also, against Merktide, I'm really not excited about Cultivator Colossus. Um, so, um, and I think the second Azusa is a pretty easy thing to cut in a lot of matchups. Yeah. Um, and from here, I'm kind of feeling like maybe one Saga, one Amulet out. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and so you're kind of, and then like in this sense, I think you're going a little bit more mid-rangey. I might even, since we're cutting the turn timbers, I might even just cut the second Colossus and keep in a pact. I think... A Summoner's Pact is better than a Cultivator Colossus in this matchup, probably. Um, so maybe maybe something like this. So like we're trimming on a Summoner's Pact be and Turn Timber because they're kind of weak to Counterspell. We're trimming on Cultivator because it's weak to Dress Down. Uh, we're trimming on some of the more combo ramp while keeping in some of the more fair ramp while we play more mid-rangey and then like dismember and fire spout help us against magus endurance helps keep their graveyard in check you know keeping back merc tides and unholy heats uh Beseju helps against blood moon and dress down hearse uh also you know nice and cavern so i i think something like this is is probably for this list what i would be doing against merc tide Um, yeah, these all these start except for maybe the maybe the best age I might like leave in the board, but other than that, that's definitely things I would definitely bring in that mm -hmm. just pass my mind about the cavern. But yeah, it, it is really important with the counter spells. Um, yeah, so I think that the, the thing with Besaju is, I mean, first of all, they're a Blood Moon deck, right? And anytime you're potentially coming up against blood moon it's always good to bring in besaju even if you're not a hundred percent sure your opponent's on blood moon i mean i've seen some merc tide lists where there was one magus in the moon in the sideboard and no blood moons but um just even you know like anything like rhinos or merc tide uh or like a red black you know mid-range deck where like blood moon is on your radar like you just want Besaju in the deck because you just there's gonna be games where Blood Moon just ends the game and Besaju is like your way back into that game and there's very little cost to having it in the deck in a matchup like that because it's it is an untapped green source so it's always just like a good land um, and then against like Merc Tide I would say um, I would say that. Like, you can also, like, against Dress Down decks, you can also sometimes cast a Titan with 8 mana untapped. Or, like, produce 8 mana, cast a Titan with, you know, enough mana left over to, if they Dress Down, besage you the Dress Down before the Titan resolves. Uh, you know, so, like, you play the Titan, they Dress Down in response, you let the Dress Down resolve, besage you it, and then the Titan resolves and you still get your trigger. Mm -hmm. I always hate seeing, <laughs> but the, adding the Besaju, even, even just for that effect, is a, a well worth it. Right. I mean, I'll, I'll bring in Besaju against Death Shadow, and they're not Blood Mooning. It's, and it's literally just for the dress down, and the fact that the cost to play a Besaju is so low because it is, you know, an untapped green source. Um, but, like, I wouldn't bring in Force of Vigor against Murktide, even, like, even if I've seen a Blood Moon, I, I don't think that this is, like, a Force of Vigor matchup. I think that's just putting you down too much on cards to play that, and even if they have a Blood Moon, they might not draw it, so then you just have a dead card. Yeah, you don't want to be two for one yourself against the, the Counterspell, hit you with a 6-6 six, six deck. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, um... So, was there other things you wanted to talk about before we get to matches? Um, no, I think I think that's, I think that's um, that answers a lot of the questions I really had. Um, so, yeah, thank you for answering those. Sure. And, um, 
I definitely like the sideboarding plan, so that, that gives me a lot more insight on how to kind of navigate those matchups. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think it's it's funny because I, I tell you, oh, let's let's do minimal sideboarding, and then it's like Murktide, and I'm like, bring in eight cards, but I don't know. <laughs> Especially yeah. Merc Tide because you want to just they're playing they're playing a little bit slower, so it doesn't it makes sense to slow your stuff down mm -hmm. just a little bit to kind of counteract that. Right, right. Um okay. Yeah, so um I think it's the gear up icon in the upper right if we want to view some matchups. Yeah, let me post up here, game history. So, when was the, so I just need to check into one thing here really quick, I need to find okay. when that 1k was, because I played, I did my, I did my league the day before, mm -hmm. so, so that was the 24th. So it's the seventeenth. Okay. That should be it. Details. Replay game one. So just click the middle thing to start. Uh, the the middle one, not the play, because if you do the play, it'll keep playing, and we might want to like pause it. Moment. So you can just keep clicking it till it has your opening hand. Okay. Yeah, I think this is a pretty clear keep. I mean, you're going turn one grazer into turn two dryad with lots of land drops to make. So I think that's that's a pretty clear keep. Okay. Uh, I think you can maybe hit the play button now, and I'll tell you to pause if I want us to pause at a moment. Yeah, pretty straightforward. Turn one. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's pause here for a moment. Um, so that turn you started with four mana in play. You played the map and you cracked it to get the bog. Um, which you played. So one of the things that I'm noticing is that um, you could have led on the explorer if you wanted to make that play, um, because if you started the turn with four mana in play, then explore. Let's say you tapped the Celestia Sanctuary to play the explorer. You could have played the Vestige, which could have given you the mana for the expedition map. Tapped the Simic Growth Chamber to crack the ex expedition map and be able to play the Bog. Um, still. And I think there's a couple reasons you'd want to do that. One, you want to advance your mana more. And two, you want to know um, what cards you're drawing after the Explore. I'm not super excited about getting Bog here um, as our land. Um, because I think the goal of this game, the way that we're going to win this game, is by resolving a Primeval Titan off of a Cavern of Souls. So I think there's a very high likelihood that we wanted that expedition map when we did crack it to get us a Cavern of Souls. Uh, I mean, getting the bog does slow our opponent down a lot, but I don't know if it ultimately gets us closer to victory. Um, so I think there, I wanted to play the Explorer, maybe get some more information uh, before I decide to crack the map. Also, um, 
so just like a good like um thing to think about when you're thinking about like how much explore costs is if you have like a land to just make the land drop with the explorer that produces mana you can think of explore sort of as a one mana spell right because it costs two but it nets you one so like when you play the crumbling vestige that sort of would net you one mana so the four mana in play you know if you're trying to like crack map and play and crack map that's three mana and then the explorer being kind of one mana would be the four mana you have in play and i don't know if that's like a useful way to think about it Mm -hmm. into making both the land drops uh, i think i think i just kind of like uh i think i just kind of like zoned in and mm -hmm. just like, well they have a big graveyard and they have three mana untapped i might face i might get a merc tide next turn and i think that's what i just kind of zoned in on yeah i mean honestly even if you didn't have the vestige like even if you were in the same situation and just had like a valakut in hand so can't do that i still think i would want to cast the explorer in that situation because I really think I'm trying to get information and trying to draw for, towards Titan and just figure out exactly what my game plan is of how I'm getting to Primeval Titan. And like I said, the bog slows them down, but like it's we're not trying to die the slowest. We're trying to win, right? And I think Cavern of Souls is an important part of us winning this game. Okay, so you can hit play and, and keep resuming the game. Alrighty. that mm -hmm. play you talked about earlier about getting the map for cavern it would, mm -hmm. have, it would have negated that that whole bit right there right we might have had to take a few more hits for three maybe even they would have to get they would be able to get a merc tide that we'd have to like chump with our grazer but i think ultimately we'd be in a much better position yeah because resolving that cultivator would have been huge mm-hmm I also, you know, mentioning about like, you know, if the castle had been a cavern, that also would have been good for us. Yeah. So like just even talking like deck building decisions, I think there there could be improvements there. Yeah, so I think that's a good example. Um, so anytime you're approaching a game, it's it's really important to not just think about like what is the like best effect that i can do this turn or what's gonna like have the greatest effect this turn i think you always got to be thinking about like how do i get from where i am right now to the place where i win this game and i think against a merc tide you know you're expecting a counter spell type deck there's two things that you need to happen you need to draw a primeval titan 
and you need to get a cavern of souls, right? Like that that's probably from that position, especially when you're flooded out in hand. Maybe in a situation like if you had, you know, at the, when you did the Bajukabob play, if you had like two primeval titans and a summoner's pact in hand, I think that play makes perfect sense because you can run a few primeval titans into some counter magic, you know, before like you know one finally is going to resolve but in a place where you don't even have the primeval titan in hand you need that first threat you do draw to resolve for sure i think that's a situation where you pretty badly need to get cavern of souls makes sense okay uh do you want to look at game two then Okay, so just use the middle button until we can uh, get the opening hand. Okay. Uh, and, uh, well, we already talked about sideboarding for this matchup, so we don't really need to... I But you can always do, like, a right-click view sideboard on our future matches, and uh, we'll be able to see how you sideboarded. Um, so how do you feel about this hand looking at it now? Or not. I mm -hmm. think I, I think I liked it, but I also felt that it was like a little too slow. Mm -hmm. And that was like one of the things. But I did have, but I did have two cards that I really mm -hmm. liked in the hand, which was endurance and unlicensed hurts. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't know. That was that's like my initial impression is that it it is really really slow. So looking at it now, would you say would you say you think this is a keeper mulligan? Um, looking at it now, I might be opted to keep it. Mm -hmm. I I agree with that. I think um I think I like uh Arboreal Grazer is a great thing to have in hand if your opponent leads on a turn one Ragavan, especially considering your opponent is on the play. Um I think having two good hate cards, one that you can play as early as turn two, like I mean you can either endurance on turn two or hearse on turn two. Um I think like means you're you're getting some uh, play and getting some interaction quickly. So I, I think even though this hand is pretty far away from you know making a primeval titan, I think getting down a fast hearse and a fast endurance. Not to mention like you've got grazers to sort of stonewall ragavans and maybe even block a ledger shredder before it gets too big. I I, li I actually like this hand. All right. Let's see if I let's see if I share the same sentiment about two weeks ago. I did not. Okay. I think uh, I also felt this one was also really, really slow, and I don't think I kept this one either. I, I tend to agree with that. Uh, it doesn't have a bounce land. It doesn't have... I mean, you're basically counting on the Urza Saga to get you, like, an amulet, and then have, like... Maybe if you had, like, an, an amulet in this hand, you might be, like, tempted to keep it because you could, like, go turn one Urza Saga, play amulet, and then if you draw... it a uh, bounce land you could be going for like titan as early as turn three but i think as it is it just doesn't really have anything going on Great, yeah, i agree and i think i kept this hand yeah I, I like this one uh so looking at it now what are you feeling as far as um bottoming tempted to bottom these two and then just keeping mm -hmm. this five yeah i do think that that i don't think that that's a terrible way to do it um i generally think when you're down to a five card hand keeping two pieces of ramp can be like a little bit ambitious because you get to go like your turn one grazer, your turn two dryad, right? But then you're left with no lands in hand and sort of no threats in hand. So I'm kind of tempted to maybe bottom one of the ramp pieces over the Summoner's Pact. And given that our opponent is a Ragavan deck, I'm probably thinking dryad in this case. So like, like yeah, I mean, it is pretty... We are, you know conceding that we're playing a pretty slow game 
by keeping this grazer and not the dryad. Um, but at the same time, I think we have a lot of opportunity to play sort of a slower game against uh, Merktide, especially having the Cavernous Souls already set up. And, you know, even if we have a bunch of ramp, you actually have to have the land drops to make the, those like the lands to make those land drops for the, that ramp to be any good. I think the other option is, you know, you could keep the Dryad with the plan to play Dryad on turn three off the cavern. Uh, the danger with that is you would need to draw a, another land before turn three if you don't want to be able to cavern on Dryad and then bounce rebounce it to play it back on Nymph. Um, which could be a problem with like from a land sequencing perspective. I also think Ragavan's a problem. Um, so yeah, I, I think generally I would probably bottom uh, Dryad Forest. And like also the advantage of Grazer is it could set us up, you know, you never know, you could draw like an Endurance or something and it could set us up for like a fast Endurance or another Dryad we draw or something. So I don't know, that that's just my impression of it. Um, nope, that makes sense. I agree with that. Um, I, 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 yeah. guess, I guess we'll see here what I what I decide to do here. Um, yeah. But I'm pretty sure I did keep this hand. Uh, let's see. So I just click the middle one or I just press play? You can hit play. Um, but I think... Uh, yeah, my first initial thought. I think our, our, our number one thing that we're thinking right now is we're wishing for our, our seven back. Yeah. yeah. We just drew the Titan anyway. Yeah. Okay. Now, do you know if yeah. bottoming, I think, is the correct decision there because we need lands. So I think you did the right thing by bottoming there. And I think you actually, the way you bottomed, uh, as far as like how you set up your five guard hand, it is working out a little bit so far. I mean, we'd rather that subtlety hits the Dryad than a Titan. So we are kind of. We are kind of making it work here. You can hit play. Okay. But it does seem like things are going about as well, and our opponent's on one land. They're going about as well as we could hope for. He just scooped. <laughs> yeah. So. I mean, I think our opponent obviously drew very poorly. I think they also mulliganed a lot. Um, Let's but. See. Maybe yeah. He, I think what I, I think the impression I got was that he kept the one lander with the Ragaman, hoping mm. the Ragaman would come through. Right. Which is why I was saying, like, with the bottoming, you definitely want to keep the Grazer in hand, right? Because, you know, I think regardless of whether or not we had the Dryad or the Summoner's Pact, I think we were well set up this game with the Grazer just stonewalling the Ragavan. Uh okay, so let's look at game three then. Uh, I mean, we don't really need to talk about this one, I don't think. Yeah. Um, so what do you feel about this hand looking at it right now? Um, I mean, like, two versus Saga is great, but, I mean, if they have, like, a, a turn two Magus, if, they're, if they go, like, turn one Ragavan, turn two Magus, mm -hmm. it, like, really gets blown out of the water. Mm -hmm. um, and we also have no natural green source. I mean, other than the vestige, but yeah. yeah. But, I mean, yeah, it's, uh, it's not like, but it, it never taps. It never keeps tapping for green. Is yeah, what I what I was kind of meaning. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I tend to agree. If the Boros Garrison was maybe a green bounce land, I might think about it, just because like, you know, there is like a world in which you go for like double amulet and like try and Colossus. But even then, like, I, I, this is also an example of, like, I just don't think Colossus is particularly good in this matchup just because, like, you need so many things to go right for the Colossus to ever work that I'd almost rather have just basically any other card than the Colossus in hand right now. Yeah, I think, I think, I, I don't think I kept this one either. I think I yeah. shipped it. I think that's correct. Oh, no, I kept it. Okay. Okay. 
And you bought him bo Boris. Okay. I do think leading on the saga is correct. Okay. Well, not everything's going terrible for us. We did draw a green bounce land. Okay, so maybe let's pause there for a sec. Um, I'm not entirely sure you want to bottom the Dryad. Um, maybe you do. It's it's kind of hard, but like what I'm thinking about is like the sequence for next turn. We're drawing a card, and then we're getting... Um, then we're presumably playing this Lessening of Sanctuary to play a Dryad which is going to give us a total of six mana. And I think there's a pretty reasonable chance that the first Dryad gets countered. And I don't think there's any way we're casting this Cultivator Colossus without a Dryad in play. So maybe keeping the, the other Dryad on top... I guess it doesn't matter. They have, Rag of, it, they have Ragavan, so it doesn't matter. So if they... Right. Yeah, so there's no reason not to bottom it with Ragavan. I sometimes I forget about subtlety plus Ragavan. So it didn't matter bottoming, so we can keep going. Right. Yeah. I always forget about that subtlety plus Ragavan interaction. It's always bad. Yeah. Okay, can we pause here? Okay. So, um, with bouncing the Celestia Sanctuary to hand, um, you're putting yourself on, behind on your mana development. Um, you have the Vesuva in hand, so when you need to have a green bounce land for like getting out the Cultivator, you will have a bounce land in hand to do that. And I, so I think you wanted to bounce the vestige to hand to have more mana development like let's uh, look at this situation right the dryad's getting subtleteed um so it's going on top of our library next turn we'll untap with one mana uh we can like or a uh, dryad's going bottom i assume we'll atop, untap with one one mana celestia sanctuary gets us to five Whereas if we had the Celestia Sanctuary in play instead of the Vestige, we could play a Vesuva on Celestia Sanctuary, potentially get up to six mana, which is a pretty important number. Like, it potentially allows us to even try for a Primeval Titan. Like, I think we're pretty far behind. I think if the Dryad doesn't resolve, our only hope of winning is to sort of, like, top deck a Titan and YOLO it, you know? So... I think generally speaking, uh, you know, it's always good to have one bounce land in hand, but anytime you're getting like past that, like one bounce land in hand, even with amulets in play, you would rather bounce other lands than bounce the bounce land just to leave more mana developed. Yeah. And I think, I think that's what happened. I think I just like spaced the, mm -hmm. uh, the Vesuva being in hand mm -hmm. and I just bounced the bounce land back out of habit, but no, yeah. I think of that just like um, using your work using your work to um, develop my mana base yeah 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 i mean you got to think about vesuva as a bounce land once you've got a bounce land in play because that's almost always what it's going to be when you have a bounce land in play of course okay we can keep uh, going let's go ahead and see what happens here i bottom it mm-hmm which is, I think it's correct because now I think our out is probably drawing like Arboreal Grazer or Azusa and like somehow this Cultivator resolves. Um, which I, yeah. So obviously, yeah. So um, 
Yeah, I think probably mulliganing that hand would have been the better call. Um, and I think we've kind of seen like Cultivator Colossus not really shining here. Um, I think hands like, you know, that that one hand game two where we have like, you know, Grazer into an Endurance, like even something like that, I think would be nice. Uh, like a five card, if we had a five card hand that we got to like go Grazer into a turn two Endurance, I think we have a reasonable chance of like putting up a fight this game and just hoping to like eventually cavern into Titan. Um, but as is, our opponent also had a good draw. They went Ragavan into a bunch of interaction. So that, that can be hard. Um, yeah, Ragavan, Ragavan double, uh, double subtlety with the subtle, when one of the subtlety sticking is mm -hmm. a little rough. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, you want to look at the next match? Okay. I also, I think I'm going to split this video in two. Uh, so I'm going to do a end to this video and we'll resume. Uh, so I'm going to stop recording now and we'll, we'll resume recording with the next rat match. Um, just because, uh, sometimes OBS is weird and I'll lose stuff. So.